I'll put this up for you guys to uh, get you started today. Give you something to think about, put in the chat. You're a phone. What percentage are you at today? Mm -hmm. I say, I think I put myself at a one this morning. I slept really, really well last night. I don't remember even dreaming. I was just out. Didn't hardly wake up at all. So that's the best sleep I've had in weeks. Lots of twos and threes. Doing okay content. Just trying to make it to the break. Just trying to get through the end of the semester here. Oh, where was the other one I had? Uh, this would be interesting too. Let me, let me pull this up. Here's here's a uh, choice for you. Number one or number two? A little something different there. Unlimited free Wi-Fi forever, or your battery never loses charge. Oh, we're going for the free Wi-Fi. Unlimited free Wi-Fi. I wasn't sure how you guys would go on this. I kind of thought, hmm. I mean, battery never losing charge would be pretty cool, too. But, yeah, I guess if you can't get Wi-Fi, it doesn't matter how charged your battery is. So, yeah, we're all a one on that. Okay. All right. All right. Well, let's uh, flip over, take a look at some algebra here this morning. Oh, I need to pull up our student view. All right. Zero B. Let's see what we're looking at this week. All right, let's go to our grade screen as usual. And we scroll way down here to the bottom. And wow, look at this. We're, I can't go down any farther. That's the bottom of the page. Uh, no, no, no. 4.06, 4.07. It's all about graphing this week. Exponential functions and logarithmic functions. No more uh, assignments after that. So the only thing left is the semester final after this week. So if you're not exempt, uh, I'm going to wrap module four test into the semester final. If you are exempt, hey, this will be the last thing you do for the semester, 4.06, 4.07. Of course, official exemptions haven't been sent out yet, but, you know, no more than four tardies or absences in this class. No more than four absences in advisory. You have to have a 75% or higher grade no missing assignments, which means practice assignments. Well, if you skip the practice test, you probably ought to go back and do it before exemptions come out. Uh, if you meet all the other qualifications, you'd hate to not be exempt because you didn't take a practice test. So no missing assignments means no missing practice assignments even. So, all right, we're going to look at 4.06, 4.07 today. See what we can learn about graphing exponential and logarithmic functions. All right, let's pull this lesson. There we go. Waclaw Serpinski. What a name. We don't see anyone named Waclaw around here. Maybe maybe should I talk to my daughter. You know, right? They're having a, a baby boy in May. I should name Waclaw. That just seems to be a, a powerful name of some kind. Waclaw Serpinski. He was a Polish math mathematician back during World War I, and he worked with fractals. Fractals. And he discovered what we have called the Serpinski Triangle. So uh, there, if you need to listen to the correct pronunciation, you can click there and hear Serpinski, but that's, that's the pronunciation. So a fractal is a geometric figure that's divided into pieces, which are all similar in shape, just smaller than the original. So making smaller triangles than that triangle and keep dividing it into smaller triangles. So have you ever seen a Serpinski triangle? Well, here, I will show you the Serpinski triangle here. And there are college professors that dedicate all of their studies to fractals. I, I had some of those at the U of A that showed us these wild looking fractals and different things like that. So let's look at a fractal, the Serpinski triangle. One method of creating the triangle is by first drawing an equilateral triangle which means the same length on each side. Remove another, smaller equilateral triangle from inside the original. 
The vertices of the removed triangle meet at the midpoints of each segment of the larger triangle. Next, three more equilateral triangles are removed from inside each of the remaining three triangles. They could do that faster, I think. The process of removing triangles inscribed within the larger triangle can continue forever. They just keep doing that, taking out smaller and smaller and smaller triangles forever. Uh, the Sierpinski Triangle. So we're going to learn this lesson, uh, how does the average rate of change vary on an exponential function? What effects does adding a constant have? And how can exponential functions be utilized to fit data? So let's look at this real quick. Uh, Sierpinski's Triangle demonstrates an application of an exponential function. So yeah, well, that triangle actually represents the function f of x equals 3 to the x power. f of x right over here, 3 to the x power, where x is the stage at which triangles are removed from the existing triangles. So like stage 1, you have 1, you know, x equals 1. That would be when there's three triangles. Before you start anything, it's x is 0. 3 to the 0 power is 1. You have one triangle. You know, this video kind of talks about how, how this triangle actually represents exponential, which is kind of cool. The exponential function is f of x equals 3 to the x. At stage 0, when x equals 0, the function equals 1. Because anything to the power of 0 equals 1. indicating there is only one solid triangle. This is how the fractal begins. At stage 1, f of x has a value of 3. This means that the first time a triangle is removed from the center, there are three triangles left. At the second stage, f of x has a value of 9. So 9 triangles remain. At stage 3, f of x has a value of 27. So the third time equilateral triangles are removed, 27 triangles are left, and so on. And so on, and so on. So yeah, it really does represent an exponential, which is why Sierpinski's triangle kind of became a thing, is because, wow, that, that is an exponential equation in, in visual form. So that was just a different way other than a graph of illustrating Sierpinski's triangle. Uh, now, you can actually graph the exponential function, and it would look like this. This is Sierpinski's triangle in graph form. Uh, when x is 0, there's 1. That's where it crosses the 1. When 1, which is the first stage, you see it equals the y equals 3. At 2, the y equals 9. At 3, it's off the graph. It's way up at 27. But that is the exponential graph of the f of x equals 3 to the x power equation. So if we look at the domain and range of that, let's look at that real quick. The domain, of course, is all the x's. So we see uh, the domain is from negative infinity to infinity, all real numbers, because this is going to continue forever to the left. It's going to continue ever to the right, but it's going to be going up really fast. But it is moving to the right forever. The range is all the possible y's, and we see it definitely goes up to infinity on the right end. The left end, what's the lower end of the range? Well, the range is actually y is greater than 0, because it's going to have every number greater than 0. 
Notice I did not say y is greater than or equal to zero because this graph will never ever touch the x-axis. It will never get to y equals zero. It will just continually towards infinity get infinitely closer and closer to zero, but it will never equal zero. Now, Desmos may think it is at some point just because it gets so close. You got to zoom in a long ways to see that it's not zero, but it will never get to zero. All right, let's go down here. Take a look at some more exponential functions. We'll answer in the questions below. All right, so if the base of your exponential function, like three to the X, if it's greater than one, like this has a base of 1.5. So the equation is 1.5 raised to the power of X. The graph looks like this, but let's look as the base gets bigger. If it gets to two and three and four, there's a two. Okay, it gets steeper. I'll go to two and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half, five. Notice the bigger the base is, the steeper, the faster it goes up, right? Because five squared would be a lot bigger number than two squared. So by the time we get to two, this graph is going to be up to equal 25. The Y is 25 when it's two. But when we go back to where it just equals two, the Y only equals four when two is squared. So if our base is greater than one, we see it gets steeper and steeper. So let's look at a base less than one. Now, if the base is one, it's just a line starting at zero. Because, well, this is if the base is zero. If the base is actually zero, it's just a line at zero. Because zero squared, zero to the fourth, zero to the fifth, zero to the eighth, it's all zero. So that's not an exponential equation. Actually, at that point, it's a linear equation. Same thing if it's equals one. One squared, one to the third, one to the fourth, one to the fifth, one to the sixth. It all equals one. That's just a linear equation. But if it's between zero and one, it looks like this. Oh, sorry. 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. The closer it gets to zero, the steeper and steeper it is there. 0.1. It won't let us do 0 0.05 on this illustration, but that would be even steeper yet. So 0 0.1 to the power of X gets to be a very, very big number faster and faster. But the closer it gets to one, the closer it gets to be in a horizontal line. Because when, when it actually is one, it is horizontal. All right? So that's how the exponential equations graph depending on what the base number is that's being raised to the exponent of X. All right. So that's just a nice little illustration. It says, think about it. Move the point on slider B when the base of an exponential function is greater than one, describe the graphs. It says, reading each graph from left to right, as the X coordinates increase, the Y coordinates also increase. Of course, as the base increases, the slope gets steeper and steeper, which, again, we can understand that. So let's uncheck the box and, and go to the between zero and one. We looked at that, too. How do they compare? They go downward instead of upward. It's a decreasing graph. What happens when it's zero? It's just a, a linear line. When zero is raised to a negative exponent, the base becomes a fraction with zero in the denominator. That's why it doesn't exist. Because we saw that up here when we had it equal to zero. It only exists on the positive side. Because zero to the negative one power is the same as one over zero, which is undefined. So you cannot have anything on that side. Because zero to the negative third power is the same as one over zero to the third power, which does not exist because you cannot divide anything by zero. And what happens when it's one? It's a linear line at one because one to any power stays one. So we, we kind of talked about that when we looked at that, but that's a nice little graphic below to reemphasize those things. All right, we have one more video we're going to watch and it talks about 
um, using an exponential equation and how the base affects things. We can we can learn a lot about an exponential equation by knowing what the base means, whether it's bigger than one, smaller than one, and how that affects our equation. So we're going to watch this video, and that'll be our last one we're watching today. Today I'm going to show you how to use the properties of exponents to interpret exponential functions. In this particular set of examples, I'm going to be referring to the value of boats. I have boat one, two, and three. So beginning with boat one, the very first number you're going to see is 5,000. This is the initial value of the boat. The next thing you're going to notice is being multiplied by 1.25. This is our percent of change. What is happening to that initial value? And then our exponent of x is where we would put our numbers of years. So if I wanted to know how much this boat would be worth in 10 years, I would replace this x with 10 and then evaluate this. So what else can I tell about boat 1? Well, we know, like we said, the initial value was 5,000, but it's being multiplied by 1.25. What does that tell us in terms of percentage? The number is greater than 1, so it is keeping its value, but it is gaining 25% in value. So if I were to classify this, I would say that it is increasing. So boat number 1 actually is increasing its value year after year by 25%. Now looking at boat two, same thing. Notice we have the initial value first, it is a value of $4,000. Here our percent is 0 0.40, our percent of change, and we have the x for our number of years. Now the difference between these two you'll see is that this one is greater than one, and boat two is less than one. So what does that mean? It means that we're going to keep 40% of our initial value. So we know our percentages go up to 100, so if I keep 40, that's also saying that I lost 60. So if I'm classifying this one, I would say it's decreasing. I'm actually losing 60% of the value because I'm keeping 40%. So when I'm looking at boat 3, I have it just in words, but not in the expression. So how can we make that happen? Here we have an initial value of 4,500. The same as we have with boats one and two at our initial value. Then we're multiplying by our percent of change. So here it says it's losing 50% each year. So if we are losing 50%, that means we are keeping 50%, expressed as 0 0.50. And then the last thing we add is our x, which is our number of years. So we can easily determine by the way it is written here, our percent of change is less than one, so we know it's decreasing. And of course, our problem actually says it loses. So we would say it is decreasing. Now, when you look at these two, we have 4,000 times 0 0.40 and 4,500 times 0 0.50. A lot of times we tend to think, oh, well, this is decreasing by a lot less because it is 0 0.40. But really, notice we are keeping 40%, meaning that we are losing 60%. As opposed to here, we are losing 50%. So if you were comparing these two boats, this one is losing value at a much faster rate than boat number three. So knowing what these numbers mean and knowing how to classify them as increasing and decreasing be very helpful in interpreting these functions. And that is how you use the properties of exponents to interpret exponential functions. So really that's telling us we should know what the graph of a looks of a, an equation looks like uh, by looking at the equation. Because if you see that it's 1.25, you showed that first boat example. If it's increasing in value, when it graphs, that means as it goes from the negative infinity to infinity, it should start going up because it's increasing. When you see it's below one, it's 0 0.4, 0 0.5, whatever it is, that means it's going to be starting up here and it's decreasing as it goes. So you're expecting the graph to look that way. So that kind of helps us understand just by looking at the equation, what kind of graph should we expect when we see that equation? So, all right, let's look at the key features of exponential graphs. So just a few things we look at when it comes to an exponential graph. One is the y-intercept. At When x equals zero, what is the value of the equation? Where is the y-intercept? You know, when x equals zero, where is it crossing the y? 
And then the other thing we look at is the end behavior, right? And that's based on whether it's base is above one or below one, right? Because when the base is above one, we know it's increasing. So the left side is going towards zero usually or one or some number. Remember, it's an asymptote. It doesn't ever touch that zero or if we have a transformation that moves it. So that's the, the left. It's going towards a number. And the right end, it'd be going up towards infinity. The other end behavior we have is when that base is below one, like 0.5, like he was talking about. Then you have the left side is going up towards infinity, but the right side is coming down and approaching a number. Approaching a number. It doesn't, it doesn't go to negative infinity in either way on those uh, graphs that he's talking about. So let's talk about this equation right here. If we have a of x equals p b x plus k, I'm like, oh, let me open up Desmos so we can kind of play with that. So a of x equal p of b x plus k. All right, let's see if I can actually just type that in the Desmos and it'll give us some slides to play with. A of X equals P B to the X plus K. Okay. So let's see. We need a base bigger than one. So we have an exponential equation. So there's a base of two. All right. So all these other numbers are one. Right now it's just a coefficient of one. And let's, let's put K at a zero. So there is no K. So that is the same right now with b equal to. This is the same equation as just y equals 2 to the x. You see, that's the same graph. The black graph and the red graph are the same. So if we have this equation that they want us to look at, p, which is just a coefficient out in front, it, it causes a transformation. b of x is the base raised to the x power like two, and then plus K, plus K is a transformation, right? Plus K is a transformation. So, so this talks about a few things. Let's talk about if the P is a positive number, that's that coefficient out front. So if this P number out here is, is, and I'll, I'll go ahead and put this uh, like that. I'll put it the same way as the equation has the base in parentheses. If there's a number out front here, that's a positive number. Let's say it's three. Now notice what it does to the graph is it makes the graph go up three times faster than just having the normal two of X. I guess I can do it with my slider, maybe even easier. Let's make P three. Three times faster. So instead of crossing the Y axis at one, it crosses the Y axis at three. See our, cause it's, being multiplied by three. This number here is three, the P. You know, if we make that even larger number, it goes up even steeper. So you have whatever we multiply by changes that Y intercept by that amount. It's going steeper and steeper. If that number's below one, well, if it's below zero, if it's a negative number, because let's see what happens when it's a negative, it's going to reflect it downward. If it's just negative one, let's change our base to negative one. I mean, our, our coefficient to negative one. It's the exact same size. This went through zero one, this went through zero negative one, because we're just multiplying everything by negative one. If this crosses here at 4.993, down here it crosses at negative 4.993. But the smaller that gets, the negative, just the negative is going to flip it where it's downward, right? It's going to reflect downward over the asymptote, over the asymptote. Or does it go over X? Does it reflect over the X? The only way we can tell is to move the asymptote off of zero. That's that plus K. Remember, if we add a number to the end of the equation, it, it moves it up or down. Let's change this number. Three. Let's add a plus three on here. So if we add a plus three, that's a transformation, right? When we add numbers that are subtract numbers, it's going to make it go up or down. Notice it did not reflect over the x-axis. 
with this negative one out front, it reflects it over the asymptote. It's still approaching three, y equals three, but it's just going downward. So when this P is a negative number, it's going to reflect it downward over the asymptote. If that's not a one, if the P itself is not a one, it's just going to make it steeper. See how much steeper it's getting? The slope gets a lot steeper in a negative direction or in a positive direction if that P is not one. If the P is less than one, like 0.2, look, it's getting wider. The slope is going down. Instead of being real steep right here, it's not nearly as steep. It's moving down here. So if that's below one, it's not as steep. So the positive or negative makes it reflect downward over the asymptote if it's negative. And if it's less than one, it makes it less steep. If it's greater than one, it makes it more steep. And of course, that K just moves it up and down. Doesn't change the shape of the graph at all. It's just if K is a negative, it moves down. K is a positive. So we see that transformation is true with everything. That was true with uh, linear equations, uh, quadratic equations, all kinds of equations. If that plus K at the end always does the same thing. It just raises it up and down. Raises it up and down. All right, I'll put it back at zero. So here's a little table they had that kind of shows the same thing. If P is positive, all right, so it's a positive number. If it's greater than one, it goes up if the base is greater than one. So let's talk about the base, the base, the number being raised to the exponent of X. We saw that if the base is bigger than one, it's going to go growth. If the base is smaller than one, like the guy in the video was showing us, if the base was 0.5, it's going to go down. We didn't play with the base here. If we move the base below one, I'm sorry, not below one, but below zero, 0.5, it goes down. We change that two to a 0.5, and it goes down. So B is greater than one, B is less than one. If the P is negative, that's that in front. We said it reflects over the asymptote. See, this one that was a positive slope because it had a B greater than one becomes a negative. And same way, if it, we have this one that's decreasing, if the coefficients are negative, it's going to be increasing in a different way there. So we can look at that real quick. Uh, let's make the P a negative. See, now it's an increasing because the P is a negative number. Still going to approach that asymptote. Uh, let's see, put the asymptote of three. Increase into the asymptote of three. There we go, 2.93. There we go. Again, while it looks at it, it thinks it's it's almost three, 3.02, 3.01, but it's not three. It doesn't ever touch the three. All right. So this says, describe the y-intercept and the end behavior of the following graph. Well, the y-intercept we see is at negative 1. 0, negative 1. The end behaviors, the left end goes towards infinity. The right end approaches y equals negative 2. It doesn't go to negative infinity because it never touches negative 2. But the right end approaches y equals negative 2. Check your work. Y-intercept's at negative 1. You know, point zero negative 1. The graph goes up on the left and downward and gets close to y minus equals negative 2. y equals minus 2. All right, let's talk about the average rate of change. Remember this, anytime you see average rate of change, that's just another word for slope. Always, that means slope. So when this says um, Juan has a job that pays him $9 an hour, if he works 14 hours, he makes $126. That means for every hour he works, his paycheck goes up $9. So his average rate of change is $9. So per hour, $9 is the slope of his pay. All right, then it gives you another example. Like if someone was going down a mountain on skis, 
you can have an average rate of change if they started at the top and they skied down this mountain and let's say it's one, two, three, four, let's say it's 500 feet and it took them five hours, they would be going at negative 100 feet per hour. So their slope would be negative 100. If they did that in two hours, then it'd be 250, right? Now notice at points they were going slower. The slope was less. At points the slope was greater. But you just look at the average. If I drew a straight line from the top to the bottom, what's the average? Uh, this graph is really small. Let's see if I can make that bigger on your screen. This is talking about if you're driving on a trip. Let's say you're driving from Tampa, Florida to Gainesville, Florida. It's from zero, zero to two and a half, 140. That means it looks like two and a half hours later, because this X is time and hours. This is miles. In two and a half hours, you drove 140 miles. So you can figure the average rate of change, which was like 58. So did you drive 58 miles an hour the entire time and leave Tampa and arrive in Gainesville? No. Look, if you look at the actual graph, they were driving 70 miles an hour for the first hour because in the first hour, they covered 70 miles. Then the second hour, they didn't go as far. The next hour, almost an hour, they'd only made it about 18 more miles. Perhaps a stop for lunch. Maybe you got gas, got a snack, whatever, for whatever reason, during that second hour, Marisol, this is Marisol's trip. In the second hour, Marisol didn't make it very far, but then was back driving, looks like 70 miles an hour again, looking at the slope of that in there. So while the slope was 70 and then 18 and then 70, if we look at the average rate of change for the trip, it's the red line. If you draw a straight line. All right, let's bring this back down to size. So, oh, 56, not 58. 56 miles per hour. All right, we're going to go to the next page. If I can get there. There we go. So, average rate of change. Like, let's look at average rate of change while we're talking about that. Let me get rid of uh, all this mess here. I'm going to make this back to a positive equation. We're going to take off the transformation, put it back down at the bottom. And if we said, what is the average rate of change between X equals zero and X equals three, which means basically we're looking at this point and this point, right? This is when X equals zero. This is when X equals three. What is our average rate of change? So it's basically saying, if we drew a straight line, there we go. And we just drew it from, I'm gonna draw it from those points. Zero is less than X, it's less than, Three. There we go. All right. So if we drew a straight line from where X equals zero to where X equals eight, we're looking at this equation. There we go. If we draw a straight line between those two points, zero, one, and three, eight, what is the slope of that green line? That's what it's asking. When it says, what's the average rate of change for this? Well, right here, the slope is less than right here. Right here, it's really steep. Well, we would do the math. 8 minus 1 divided by 3 minus 0. So, 7 thirds is the slope. That's the slope of that green line. So, that would be the average rate of change. For every 1, and let's, let's make this go by 1 so we can see that. From zero to one, this went up seven thirds, which is two and a third, right? So it went up one, went up two, and it went up to another third. There it is, 3.333. Then it goes up another one, two, and a third. Where's two? Two, two, right there, 5.667. And then another two and a third to get to the eight. 
So that's what average rate of change is. A slope, if we drew a straight line, what is the slope of that straight line? That is what the average rate of change is. All right, so this has basically the same thing we were doing on the other page. We can play with uh, the base and other things, but they're adding another factor in here. They're adding this X minus H. Instead of raising it just to the power of X, we're raising it to the power of X minus H. That is that other transformation. Remember, if we take out X, let me do it where it's bigger. You can see it over here again. Y equals 2 to the power of X minus H. And then we can put a plus K on there. So if I add those sliders, put K back to zero, put H at zero. So if those are zero, this is just Y equals two to the X power. But remember, we can do transformations by putting a plus or minus with the X. Remember, that means it's a horizontal. It goes left and right. So let's change this to a one, X minus one. What happens if it's X minus one? Minus, remember, if it's a minus, it moves to the right. Let's put the original up there so we can see how it moved. Two to the X. See, the original point was right here. It moved over here now to one, one. Everything shifted right one unit. This went from three, eight over here, which there's three, eight. Two four eight over here. Everything just added one to the X. If we do a plus one, we'll change H to a negative, which means X minus negative one, which would be X plus one. It shifted everything left. So this point over here that was at one, two is now at zero, two. That becomes the new Y intercept. All right. And then we could also shift up and down by doing that K. If the K is minus four, it shifted down. Instead of being up here at positive two where it was, it went to negative two. Let's change this back to zero. So we'll go back to the original equation. So now you can see the original equation, since I took H equal to zero, this is gone. It's just two to the X. The Y intercept was one. Now it's at negative three because we shifted it we made K negative three. So remember, K makes it move up and down. H makes it move left and right. Transformations. And that's what this is allowing you to do is move things up and down. Um, make a coefficient of one. There you go, coefficient of one. Move things up and down with the K. Move things left and right with the H. So if you need to play with that to figure out the H and the K again, the transformations work the same here as they did with quadratics, as they did with all the other things we looked at. All right, and wants us to look at a few things here. F of X equals one third to the X. This is a base that's less than one. So we should know it'll go down. And since there's no transformations, there's no plus K or anything, it will approach zero. Make sure and put the parentheses around the one third or else the X may not go forth all of it. So one thing I would do when I look at real quick here, let me take these off. Let's look at that Y equals parentheses one third to the X. Oh, parentheses to the X. Okay, that's the graph I was just talking about. This is actually a reflection of three to the X. Look at that. Three to the X and one, one over three to the X is a reflection of the Y axis of the exact same graph. The same Y intercept. One over three to the X is a reflection of three to the X. Notice that zero, they're the same. At zero, they both equal one because one third to the zero power equals one. 3 to the 0 power equals 1. Everything to the 0 power equals 1. So that's why they're the same there. But otherwise, one's going up and one's going down as X gets larger. It is a reflection.
Uh, oh, it shows you the reflection right there. All right, let's look at example two that they have for us. Graph this using graphing technology. Two to the X plus one. Okay. Y equals two raised to the power of X plus one in parentheses. Notice instead of having a y-intercept to one, it's moved up here because the graph shifted left. The y-intercept moved left one unit. It went to negative one, one. Because this is a horizontal translation. Horizontal. Still has the same asymptote, though. It's still approaching zero. Example three. Two to the x plus one. Just take that plus one out of there and put it on the end, that goes up. Notice it's not exactly the same as two to the X plus one. They both have the same Y intercept, but, but let's, let's compare those. Y equals two raised to the power of X plus one. They are different. They are different. This The black one was a translation up of one of the original function. The red one is a translation left. See, the big difference there is the horizontal asymptote. When we shift it up, it's approaching one now instead of approaching zero. So it is different. And their fourth example, oh, they put up all kinds of translations together. Translating left, translating right, translating up, translating down. So again, translations work the same, the X, the H and the K for all equations, quadratic, everything here, exponential logarithms. We'll get to logarithms next lesson. All right, fitting functions to data. This is, this is an interesting thing. Sometimes, this is a little, little different. Sometimes we have data, like a table right here, but we don't know the equation. And sometimes we can't come up with an exact equation. Maybe our data does not fit an equation. In that case, we try to come up with an equation of best fit. Best fit. What's the closest we can get to having an equation? Best fit. So let's take, they gave us this little interactive graph that we can use here. And it gave us this equation. It has all zeros, basically. This is just f of x equal x right now, but it's being multiplied by zero, so there's no graph at all. So let's play with, let's make a base of one. That's right there. Let's play with these points. Let's, let's graph this table we have right here. We have the X on the left and F of X. On the, the FX is the same as Y, right? F of X equals Y. So negative five, negative one is our first point. So we can take A and drag it to negative five, negative one. There's our first point. Then we have negative two, negative one. So let's take B and put it on negative two, negative one. Zero, negative two. Okay, that's right there. One, negative three. One, negative three. And two, negative five. Two, negative five. Okay, so there's the data from the table. And we're trying to come up with an equation that would match this. So obviously we can see, all right, what do we know? It is decreasing. So our base, our base would be, well, it doesn't let us do between zero and one. So it must be a negative base. And let's raise, well, we don't want a coefficient of zero because that doesn't, uh, doesn't let us have a graph hardly all. Okay, we've lowered this down, but it's not exponential right now. We need our, we need to have some numbers. Well, we're not gonna, because we have a negative one base. Okay, so now let's have a base of negative two. So that goes down, but that's a lot steeper than what we need. Oh, maybe not. Look, I just, I move H back to zeros. Let's translate it down one, because right now we're crossing at negative one, let's cross at negative two. Bring it down one. Oh, that's pretty good. If we make the coefficient of one out here in front, so there's nothing being multiplied out front, 
we make the base a negative two raised to the x power the negative reflected it downward so instead of it going up it's reflected downward we do not do any translation left or right because the h h is zero and we make a downward shift of negative one that's pretty good all we're missing is the b point but the b is exactly the same as a that has to be a horizontal line between there so it's not going to match this is our best fit f of x equals negative two to the x power minus one that's a pretty good graph let's see what they did oh theirs is actually different well the graph looks the same but they can get the same graph with a of two b of negative two an h of negative one and a k of negative one so what did they do different than us they changed this to a two and this to a negative one same graph so there's a couple of different ways to do that but either way that's the best fit and that's that's all we can do is create a function of best fit oh there's our lesson summary this is the end of our lesson okay so for Here's the, here's the important things to learn from exponential function. An exponential function is where the variable is in the exponent and the base is not equal to 1. Because if it's equal to 1, it's just a horizontal line at 1. You can graph it with a graphing software program like Desmos or graphing calculator if you have one. Shows how to graph 3 to the power of x right there. Key features is the y-intercept, the end behavior, and the average rate of change between two points. And a function is said to be a best fit if it passes closest to the given data points. And we actually got four of the five data points on our graph. So, all right. There's some practice problems for two pages, as usual. Different things you can try to see if you're understanding uh, which function would be the best fit? Oh, so to figure that out, what I would do is I'd go to Desmos, cancel what's on there. I've got these points, one, two, two, three, three, five. So I would put uh, one, two, two, three, three, five. I put those points on Desmos. And then it says, which one of these equations would be the best fit? Well, let's try the first one, two, x plus 1 plus 1. So y equals 2 x plus 1 pl plus 1. Okay, there's the 2 x plus 1 plus 1. Is that equation of best fit? Well, I hope not. It doesn't even come close really to either any of those three points. So I would say that's probably not it. How about if it's a minus 1? No, it's closer, but still doesn't even touch any of those points. How about if it's 2x minus 1 plus 1? So minus 1 plus 1. Oh, that's perfect. That actually touches all three points. We can label those points. Actually touches all three points. We can go ahead and check the last one just to be sure. We just change it to a minus 1 at the end. But that's going to move it down too. That's a translation, right? So that doesn't do it at all. So our answer is uh, the 2x minus 1 plus 1. Submit. Good work. So go to Desmos. If you have a struggle with these, go to Desmos, graph them, and try the equations they give you as a multiple choice. There's another one. You can try that one on your own. So, all right. More practice problems over here. Graph, it tells you to graph these and then write a description. So that means you're going to do y-intercept and end behaviors. Steeper on the right side of the y-axis than exponential base of 2. All right, let's look at the assignment for this lesson before we look at our logarithms real quick. This says which graph models the function f of x is negative 2 times 3 to the x? Well... It's a negative, so it's going to be going downward. So these two are ruled out immediately. It's going to be pretty steep because you got a 3 and you have a negative 2 being multiplied by that. 
where's the y intercept going to be well here's what i would do i would say okay let's see uh, f of x equals negative two times three to the x oh it's the one that goes through negative two yeah, it must be this one that's the one that goes through negative two this one goes through positive two yeah, that makes sense. Can't be either of those. So graph this. If you're not sure, graph it. Graphing tells you a lot. You can always use Desmos, guys. Um, which graph shows f of x plus 2? Well, f of x is 3x. So if you put plus 2 on the end of it, if f of x is 3x, 3x, it wants to know what happens if you put plus 2 on the end. It becomes this graph. So you're looking for that graph. But you should know if it's got a plus two, it's going to raise the y-intercept. So it's not going to be a one. It's not going to be a negative one. It's not going to be a five. It's got to be a three. Uh, which statement describes the key features? Y-intercept and the left and right end behaviors. Calculate the average rate of change from x equals two, which is right there, to x equals six, which is up here. What's the slope of the line between those two points? And find best fit. Graph those points. Which one of these equations is closest to those points? All right, five questions. Let's look at our second lesson. Our last lesson of the semester. Love it. Okay, exponential logarithm. Let's see what you remember about graphs and reflections. There's another chance to go into the chat right here. I want you to, I'm going to number these from left to right, top to bottom. So this is number one. This is number two. Down here is number three. On the bottom right is number four. So if I was going to reflect this over the Y axis, if this was on a graph and we're reflecting over the Y axis, would that be number one, number two, number three, or number four? Reflecting this image over the Y axis. Take a guess in the chat. Sid saying number three. No, wait, he's changing his answer to number one. One, two, three, four. Reflecting this image over the y-axis. And McKinsey says number two. So I've got the one and the two. Three got scratched. Four. Nobody should say four. It's not even a reflection, right? It's the exact same image. It doesn't reflect anywhere. So four is out. One, two, or three. Nope, Sid's going to go back to three. Autumn and Jada going with two. All right. So you're right. That's that's a double reflect. Number one is a double reflection. You were wise to leave number one because you would have to reflect up and down and left and right to get this image. So the question is, is it two or three? Well, three reflects downward. Two reflects over. Where's the y-axis? Oh, the y-axis. Let's look at this. The y-axis is the up and down axis, so it will reflect this way. So it is number two. Number two. You were, you were around it, Sid. You were thinking it through. You just got your x and y mixed up. That would be over. The, this one would be over the x-axis. It would reflect downward over the x. So reflections. All right. Oh, it's got more. More? Oh, let's do another one. Still, over the y-axis. One, two, three, four for this image right here. Sid's going with four this time. Four. Yeah, this is going to be four. You guys are on top of it now. See that first one? That's going over the Y. Let's take one. We'll look at one more. Oh, party folks. Graduation day. That's coming, guys. That's coming. One, two, three, four. Still the Y. 
People are sticking with four here, it looks like. Sid's back with four again. Little trick here, but let's see. The hats, if you're reflexive with the Y, the hats are still going to be on top, right? Because you'd have to go down for it to be open. So one and three are out. So it's either two or four. And two, look, this guy with his mouth open up here is still on the same side. That didn't reflect. It just translated. So it is going to be four. Oh, it said no. Wait a minute. Did it change it on me? Oh, it changed. It. Now it's asking about an x-axis. Okay, I didn't know they changed the question. This is over the x-axis. So over the x-axis, that would be different. So Sid says, oh, that'd be three. So we'd change to that. Because, yes, if it went straight down over the x-axis, everybody would still be on the same side of the picture as they'd be on. They'd just be upside down. So, yes, going down over the x. Great. All right, let's move on. Graphs of logarithmic functions. All right, this is uh, interesting to look at. See, y equals 10 to the x, if written as a logarithm, is y equals log of x, right? Same base, base 10, base 10. Instead of an exponent, it's, it's the, the log x. It's a reflection over y equals x. A reflection so an exponent and its equivalent logarithm when you rewrite it as a logarithm reflects over the y equals x axis uh, let's see there's some additional review on the characteristics of the graph of the common logarithm we'll take a look see what it has in there well, it talks about the domain and range right so an exponential function is all real numbers but a log x has to be greater than zero for an exponential function, y is greater than zero or whatever the asymptote is if it translates. All real numbers for logarithm. Asymptotes the x-axis, but with a logarithm, the asymptotes the y-axis. Because look, when we reflect over that, it's the y-axis for this, but it's the x-axis for the logarithm. It approaches the x-axis, but never touches it. All right, so it talks about graphing log 4 of x. Log 4 of x. Well, if we were going to graph log 4 of x, let's see, maybe, maybe our calculator doesn't have anything but just the regular log button. Log 4 of x. Now, if we didn't have a base on our calculator, we only had the regular logarithm, we'd have to rewrite that. Log of x over log of 4. Right? Now, this is base 10 now. We use the change of base formula. This was base 4, but I rewrote it this way. So we can graph this if your calculator will only let you graph base 10. So let's go that and see. All right. So if I best uh, graph y equals log x. Oh, it's not typing. Y equals log x divided by log 4. So there's the graph of log base 4 of x. Notice we go through the x-axis at 1, and it gets closer and closer and closer. It says undefined. But if we zoomed in, it doesn't ever actually have a slope of undefined. So when I zoom in, now I have a slope. I, it's showing it the y is not undefined. It, well, now, now it's undefined there. So if I zoom in farther, now it's non defined. So I got to zoom in and in and in to find a number. But if I zoom out, it's going to say, oh, it's undefined there. It's not undefined. I just have to zoom in closer. But it never does touch the x axis. That's the asymptote. Well, this will keep going up and up and up and up slowly, but it's going to keep going up and up and up. So it will reach to infinity. But that's how we can do log of x divided by log of 4. Now, Desmos is pretty smart, actually. Let's check this. If I go down here to the functions, I can scroll down and find it does let me do log base something different. If I click that, it says log what base? 4 x 
So I can actually do that in Desmos, but if you if you if you have a graphing calculator or something that won't, just do the change of base. Now look, these are the exact same graph. If I turn off the blue one, there's the green one. It's the same graph. And it should be the same graph because change of base should not change the equation. It just changes how you write it. It's just rewriting it differently. And we can put y equals here too. It shouldn't change anything. But there it is. You can do different bases in Desmos. But if you can't, you can always do it like this way. It's fine. So that's what this talks about. Uh, enter log of x over log of 4. And it should look like that. Okay, next page. This won't be as long a lesson. There's only four pages total, and that includes practice. So this is lesson summary on page two. So this says, take some additional examples. Let's look at some different additional examples. Graph f of x equals log x minus 3. Now, see, they always say to do this with graphing technology. So we use Desmos on all of this. Let's graph the log of x minus 3. y equals log x minus 3. Oh, that's interesting. Let's zoom in a little bit see what's going on. Oh, see, it has an asymptote at 3. Because this is a horizontal shift. Remember translations? If we do a plus or minus with the X, that shifts it left or right. So this is almost, it's really the same graph of log X, except for we've translated it to the right. We've shifted it right three spaces. So everything over here got shifted right over here. And yes, it should still continue beyond that. But we're zoomed out so far, it doesn't, it doesn't do it. Getting a little confused, but that is an asymptote. It will never touch the three. But x equals three is the asymptote. And this keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you were to graph the function log of x on the same screen, which I did, you'd notice that it shifted to the right three units. So the vertical asymptote is x equals three now. And there it shows both of them on the same graph, like we just did on Desmos. See what else will they want us to do? Log three of x plus two, which again we can do x plus two divided by log three, and that's the same thing with log base three. So what's going on there? Well, this is shifted left two instead of it going across at one. He got shifted left and is going through a negative one. The base three just affects how steep it is. See, if that was base 10, see, it's, it's, it changes the slope. Base three. It's base two. It's even taller. See, So that just changes the, how quick it goes. So it just wants to make sure you know how to graph. Log of x plus six. Let's turn this one off to y equals log of x plus 6. It's a translation. Translates it up 6. We could do minus 4. Translate it down. Again, this is learning how to do translations. Left and right, up and down. So all these examples we're doing. Showing you how to translate left or up and down. Left and right, up and down. So graph that using technology. You see it's a shift down five. All right. So you may have noticed the logarithms get really close to the y-axis, like really close, but they do not ever cross the y-axis. Except with the horizontal shift. That's the only way to make it cross the y-axis. If we move that, if we do an x plus one, it'll shift it left one and it will cross the y-axis. So that's only a horizontal shift can make a y-intercept happen with a logarithm. And there's the lesson summary. Graphing it, it just talks about you can use change of base to graph it. And it looked like that. And a range of all real numbers and a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So the domain is x is greater than zero because it never touches zero. And the range is all real numbers. So that's the opposite of it, of an exponential. Because it has a y is greater than zero and a range, 
a domain of all real numbers. So a lot shorter lesson because all we're really doing with logarithms there is graphing them. Go to page four. Page four has the assignment. All right, we go down to the bottom. Here's the assignment. Choose work alone. We're not doing this in groups. That's hard to organize. Here's what your assignment is. All right. If you ever swam in a pool and your eyes began to sting and turn red, you felt the effects of an incorrect pH level. It's stinging your eyes, right? The pH measures the concentration of hydronium ions. That's the scientific thing of what's going on when it burns your eyes. It can be modeled by this function. P of T equals negative log 10 T. Now we know that that 10 is not necessary. It's just negative log T. Because if you don't write the 10, it's assumed to be 10. So P of, the P of T equals negative log T. So here, I'll put that up. You can just use this. You don't need to put the 10. If you don't put anything, it's assumed to be 10. So there's the equation. Negative log T. Okay. When water is, you know, P of T is the pH level. So whatever this calculates to be is the pH level. T represents the amount of hydronium ions. Okay, that's what the T is. How much hydronium ions are in there? So at 25 degrees Celsius, which is pretty warm, water has a pH of 7. That's water. It's not acidic. It's not alkaline. Anything that has a pH less than 7 is acidic. And if it's above 7, it's basic or alkaline, right? So it's, it's the opposite of acidic. Seawater, with all that salt in it, has a pH of more than 8. So it is alkaline. It's base. Lemonade, which is acidic. Lemons have acid. Is approximately three is the pH level. So it's pretty acidic. So you have to, here's your assignment, these three things right here. Create a graph of the pH function, which is this graph right here, either by hand or using technology. You can do it on Desmos and take a screenshot. That's fine. Now locate on your graph where the pH is zero and one. You may need to zoom in, but at what X value or T value really is, is the pH equal to zero and when is it equal to one? Okay, that's, that's number one. So you make a graph and tell me where those values are. Number two, the pool maintenance man forgot to bring his log charts and he needs to raise the amount of hydronium ions. He needs T to be higher and he needs T to be 0.50. So he can use your graph since he didn't bring his log charts. So on your graph, use that to find the pH level. What is the pH level if we bring the hydronium ions to 0.5? So what pH level? What would that be? If, if it's 0.5, what's the pH? Then convert it into an exponential function. And it says using Y for pH. That would mean you would change this equation to y equals negative log t. And so whatever the pH is, let's say, I'm just going to say the pH was 7 when this was negative log 0.5. You'd rewrite this as an exponential. All right? Rewrite that as an exponential, which that was... Last week's lessons, if you need to review that. Okay, and the third thing, the pool company developed new chemicals that transform the pH scale. So using the same function as the parent function, which transformation results in a y-intercept? Because this one will not have a y-intercept. y equals negative log t. See, that doesn't have a y-intercept. It does not have a y-intercept. Which one of these transformations would? If we did a plus one at the end, if we did a plus one in the parentheses with the T, or if we put a minus one as a coefficient. 
So that's what that's what you'll know. Why why does that do that? Use complete sentences and show it, show the translation on your graph. Choose which one of those is going to make it have a y intercept. Put it on your graph and tell me why did that do that. So that's the three things for this week's lesson. You do that. Put it on a Google Doc. Put it on a Google Doc. You know, when you paste your screenshot of your graphs, then you go here, choose the Google file, whatever Google Doc you chose, and submit it right here. So that is our assignment this week. Woo. Okay, guys, that's that's it for the semester. We're not doing any more lessons. Get these turned in. Hopefully, you're, you'll be exempt when the exemptions come out. Then you'll be done for the semester after doing these two assignments. If you're not exempt, okay, so we got one more test to do after this. So, all right. Any questions? Go back and dig through that. See if you, if you have problems. Uh, this is a B-Day Friday, so I'll be here Thursday and Friday. So if you have questions, you can come to class either day. And, of course, if your grade's below 70, I'll see you both days. So, all right. That's it, guys. We'll see you next time. If anybody got any questions, hang around. <laughs>